think All right, Rocket Man, what are we going to talk about today? Arrows and such. <laughs> <laughs> Random topics. <laughs> Preface: If you guys want to learn more about Rocket Man and his experience, we did a very lengthy podcast last year that I think is also on a YouTube video. So I think we have the audio version on the podcast, yep. and we have the YouTube video on our channel, mm -hmm. where you go through some of your pretty crazy experiences with the Department of Defense. That's right. That's There's right. a lot in there. There's a lot in there. It's not a big thing, but there's a lot contained in there. <laughs> there's a, and if you want to know why we call him the Rocket Man, you need to go and watch that podcast. Mm -hmm. Now you're famous. Today, he's going to explain to us how these things work and to <laughs> <laughs> how these things work. Yep. To how do you fly a stick? Yep. How do you fly a stick out of a bow and arrow? Out of a, excuse me, out of a kinetic energy spring. That's correct. Very good, Aaron. We're coming around. <laughs> we roped you fully yeah, in. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> what happened this morning, we were out here shooting in the yard, getting ready to go pig hunting. And I had around a 640 grain arrow, the 150 grain broadhead on it. And it was shooting pretty good. I actually paper tuned it with that weight on, with that point weight. And it was bullet holes. Perfect. I'd paper tune it, granted, with fletchings. Did mm -hmm. not bear shaft tune. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'd been shooting it, got my bow sided in. It was pretty accurate. I screwed on a 200 grain head instead of a 150 grain head, and I felt like I noticeably improved my accuracy. Like, I was shooting good. It went from almost good to great arrow flight. And I was like, why the hell did that just happen? And then you started telling me. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's because of a number of things. Yeah, there's a there's a, a balance, and I'd like to back up from that and talk a little bit about how arrows fly. Because if you understand how arrows fly, you'll understand immediately what you can do to change it to make them fly better. And I think that people have a decent understanding of forward of center, and what that does for you as as far as the uh, flight characteristics or the penetration characteristics. But why is that happening? Uh, and the reason is a little bit more complicated than just you're moving the center of gravity. And so I wanted to go in through some of that detail and uh, talk about aerodynamic flight. And I don't know any place in the archery community where this has really been talked about. Uh, archery's been around for a long time. There's not a real repository of technical data where you can go and say, oh, I'm going to go look that up and, and see what moving the center of gravity, aka the forward to center, moving it forward, what does that actually do? Why does that work? Troy has an answer for that. Do you want to go ahead and say no. No, of course not. <laughs> we never get the chance to do this. I never get the chance to talk about, to build up from basic principles to the actual things that make arrows fly. Uh, and over the, the course of the next 45 minutes or so, I would like to do that. Sure. I want to give the readers a uh, opportunity to go and fact check me or read more about this themselves. So I brought two books for you guys to take a look at. The first one is it's more of a high school level understanding. And by high school, I don't mean just a general high school, but like if you're uh, in an engineering student or you have fly model rockets or something like this, this stuff will be second nature to you. And so this first book is called Handbook of Model Rocketry. There's a chapter nine and a chapter 10 on, in here on drag and stability. And what applies to model rockets uh, by and large, will apply to arrows too because they're the same basic aerodynamic shape. So you can learn a whole lot in a very short amount of time if you pick up this book, and it's available on Amazon. And then the second book is the Bible for this kind of work, and it's called Modern Exterior Ballistics. This is written by uh, Robert McCoy, who since he's since passed away. He worked at Aberdeen Proving Ground, and that's where he did his career. So he worked with the, the best of the best, of the aerodynamicists available in this country and in fact in the world. And he decided that he would put out a book to explain how bullets and arrows fly. So this covers both uh, both types of projectiles. This is a great book, but let me caveat it. Unless you just like looking at pictures and reading the text, if you do not have a background in calculus and especially vector calculus, this book is not for you. <laughs> <laughs> the rocket man so the so the just to let you all know the rocket man has brought this book to my house about i think this three times and he says okay <clears throat> you're not going to understand a damn thing i'm about to tell you <laughs> this is only two pages of 350 or whatever that is however you will ruminate and you'll eventually figure it out and then he leaves <laughs> <laughs> and he shows me that, two pages and says, take pictures of those and keep studying. Yeah, that's right. Go go uh, do some homework. This is a great book. It's got a lot of calculus in it. If you really want to understand the details or if this is something that's interesting to you as a uh, first-year engineering student or second-year 
I highly recommend this book. Just one caveat, pick up the second edition of this book, not this edition that I have, because uh, he passed away before the book came out. And so there's a pro there was a problem that it wasn't edited. And so it's really nice that his colleagues got together, uh, and myself included, and we wrote uh, corrections for all of this book for the first edition. And then I found out later on they did publish a second d edition with all of those corrections. Sweet. So, yeah, great book. Highly recommend it. Either one of those books will get you further down the road. I hope just, just don't be arrogant with your knowledge. You know, share it. Uh, help other people, too. And that's what I'm trying to do. Lay it out for me. Yeah, okay. So one of the very first things I want to talk about is what makes an arrow fly stably in the air. And I've heard this uh, through, I think I've been involved in the archery business now for about seven years, since about uh, six years, since about uh, 2016 when I started looking seriously on YouTube and watching uh, the professionals talk. People who owned bow shops or had a big following, I, w I tended to go and, and watch them quite a bit. And that's kind of how I found Troy and was watching his videos. There was one particular thing on stability that I want to cover, and that is that adding more drag to your arrow increases the stability. And unfortunately, that's just not true. That's a mistake. Drag is always a byproduct of the shape that you have, and you're always going to have drag. But drag doesn't contribute in a positive way towards the stability of the arrow. What creates drag? Okay, so anything that's moving through the air is going to have drag on it, and that's because there's, there's the pressure of the air pushing on the arrow that's created by the movement of the arrow going forward. So the whole arrow has a pressure field around it. Okay. There's another part of drag, and that's called the viscous drag. That's the that's like if you're moving your hand through molasses, you c it will slow you down because there's there's something pushing. It's okay. A, it's it, it's pushing against your arm in that that motion. So two things: the pressure and the vis viscosity of the air. So it's 14.7 psi at sea level is the pressure that's on us right now, and fish don't know that they're underwater and have a right. lot of pressure on them because they've always been a fish. Yeah, they don't Essentially, know. it's pushing things out of the way. Yeah. That, that creates drag, right? At right, the simplest the, level, it's pushing point. stuff out the of the way. The arrow has to push the air out of the way. Right. And to do that takes energy. And that basically, there's a force that's pushing back. If the arrow is pushing against the air, the air is pushing back. And that force is the force of drag. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go to the whiteboard real quick and just draw a, a I basic. I would like it if you would. Okay. Just draw. Yes, a sir, professor. <laughs> Good thing you're left-handed. Yeah, that's right. The board's <laughs> in, the, in the right place for me to be <laughs> left-handed. And I'm just going to draw an arrow, a very simple one. Thank goodness because I can't really draw. That's a great looking arrow. That's an arrow, right? It's, yep. got a, it's got fletching on the back. It's got a point on the front. Yep. And it's got a shaft. So the basic features of an arrow. Okay. Thank you. So here's what happens. The arrow is moving this way, but you can also assume that the arrow is fixed and the wind is moving over the arrow. And so when I'm drawing this arrow up at this sort of an angle of attack, that's exactly what's, what I'm drawing is I'm assuming the arrow is fixed at some orientation and the air is moving over it. Okay, if you do that, let's talk about drag and why it doesn't contribute to stability. And uh, I won't be able to fully answer this until we start talking about lift and its effect on stability. But when an arrow is flying through the air, let me take Big Jake here, it pivots around the center of gravity. You guys know about center of gravity because you're always talking about forward to center, right? The center of gravity has moved past the center of the arrow. But at some point, there's a balance point here called the center of gravity. And the arrow tends to pitch when it's flying. When you, you see it fishtailing or porpoising, right? It rotates about that center of gravity when it flies downrange, okay? And that's true for, for all of these ballistic type shapes that you have a center of gravity point somewhere, and let's just put it right about the center for now, and I'll call that the CG, the center of gravity, okay? Now, we're going to talk about drag for just a minute. You've got three basic components of the drag. You've got the drag of the broadhead, you've got the drag of the shaft, and you've got the drag of the fletching. So if the, if the velocity vector is coming in like this, again, this is staying still, so the wind is coming in relative. It's called the relative wind because it's relative to the arrow shaft. You got drag acting here, and you got drag acting here, and let's just say it's, you got drag acting here. Okay, because so all of the components are slowing the arrow down, right? Okay, 
So here's the problem. Uh, you, you go to a bow shop, and the, and the guy behind the counter says, oh, you need to make the fletching bigger to get more drag at the back of the arrow, and that will increase your stability. And the problem is that's not true. And the reason that's not true is because you can follow the line of action of the drag, and you find out that it's not very far away from the center of gravity at all. In fact, if you follow that line of action, this distance might be, I don't know, a quarter of an inch or something like that. And so there's no relative movement that causes the arrow to return back to, let's say it's been disturbed, it's flying like this, and it, you want it to come back. The drag is not going to do that because this distance is not very much. Okay? Okay? So think of it like a tire iron, and you're putting a lot of force. You're pushing right through the center of the rotation of that tire iron. You're not going to be able to undo that bolt because you're, you're pushing right through the line of action of that, of that bolt. To make this more clear, let's take a look at the same arrow, but instead of drag, let's talk about, let's talk about the other aerodynamic force, and that's lift. If you've ever stuck your hand out of the window and, and held it up a little bit, it tends to, it tends to rotate around your, around your elbow. Well, that's exactly what's happening with your arrow, especially with the, with the nose and with the tail. So now, look what happens. You've got a lifting force created by the nose that's a long way away from where that rotation point is, right? And this makes your arrow, if it's, coming, if it's flying along, it makes it want to turn over, just like your hand outside the car. But guess what? You've got fletching on the back and its distance away from the center of gravity, and it wants to push the arrow back down. So it's a it's like a seesaw. Kay. That's exactly what's happening. It's teetering like that. It's teetering like that around the center of gravity. That's why if you're bear shaft tuning and you screw a broadhead on the front without fletchings in the back, the arrow is just going to go. It's that's exactly get, right. It's going to veer off. It's going to wind plane, and yeah. it's going to take off. Most of the time, yeah. Because you've got a lifting force up at the front, and you uh, don't have a counteracting lifting force at the back. And it's not just the matter of the forces. It's a matter of what their line of action and the distance away from the center of they gravity. They lift up and down too, right? Yeah. So this is something that I got lost on was lift is the lifting term. Like you pick stuff up. No. Mm -hmm. Lift is 360 degree. Yeah. yeah. In a minute we'll explain that. It's lifting up and down. Yeah, okay. Right. So it's so not it's, always up. I got yeah. you. That makes sense. So there's a way. force that's also it's like if, if you put your hand out the window and you tilt it down slightly, it's, right, it's going to go you, down. If I tilted this down, right? Yes. If I tilted it sideways, it would it would go sideways in that direction. Right. So it's just a term. Yeah. For being so off it's line it's really it, it. So this is a really interesting aside. I won't take long to talk about it, but uh, the Wright brothers really had had a lot to do with these aerodynamic terms, and and uh, when they were first using their wind tunnel that they built to understand lift and drag to be able to get their airplane off the ground. They came up with those or, or uh, really put those into the lexicon of lift. And most people, when they think of lift, they think, oh, like an airplane, it goes up, up and down, right? Or an elevator, you know, it's actually called a lift in some countries. But uh, lift can be left or right. If this is angled down, it, can be, it could be down as well. Let's look at the, at the difference here between the drag. And I said the line of action of drag around the center of gravity is very small. So it has a very small torque around that center of gravity. Whereas the lift, let's just call this L nose and this L tail, it has of the same order of magnitude as the drag, but it's 18 inches away from the center of gravity, or not 18, let's say it's 15. You shoot a 30-inch long arrow, and the, the CG's in the middle. It's 15 inches long, uh, or away from the center of gravity, and the, the tail is also 15 inches long. And what you, what you find out is whenever, whenever you understand or, or try to look at torques, torque is a distance and a force. It's like if you measure a torque, it's in foot-pounds, right? Feet and pounds, distance and force. So you have you have a force here that's lifting, and you have a distance away. And what you find out is that if this torque, let's just call it T tail, is greater than this torque that's trying to turn it this way, T nose, then it's stable. 
And what does that mean? It means that that if you have an offset or something kicks it off, like it comes off the bow and it and it tends to Wobble fishtail, yeah. right? Then if the torque produced by the tail, if this distance is greater than this distance, you're going to have a stable air flight. And that what that means is that it's going to return back to its its uh, flight path, right? It's going to try to follow the flight path that it was initially on. I hope that makes sense because what you can do to make your arrow more stable now has opened up quite a bit more. If you understand this particular concept of a torque, this distance times this force has to be less than this distance times this force, you can understand now how you can get better arrow flight with your arrow system. We talked about this earlier and let me know if I'm on the right track here, but if, for example, you put a big head in the front that is wide whatever 200 grains and you have tiny fletching in the back your drag in the front or your lift will override that that's exactly right that's in the exactly back. right so there's there's a balance here and i need to do one more step and that is to convert this and if you're going to follow along with most aerodynamicists what they're going to talk about is center of pressure and center of pressure is basically where you can replace these two forces, the force, the lifting force of the tail and the lifting force of the nose with one force that's of this magnitude, but at a different location. So basically you're just adding these two torques together and replacing it with, with one torque because this, is a, this will be considered a positive torque and this will be considered a negative torque and the, the ad addition of those two will give you the center of pressure. Let me put that on here. I'm gonna draw that same arrow and this will be an important concept for us to understand about center of pressure. Okay, so here we have the CG, center of gravity. Literally the balance point. Literally the balance point. And here we have the CP, center of pressure. Okay, this magnitude is the same as this plus this. So it's the whole lifting force. And it acts at a distance if, it, if uh, you work this out. If your arrow is stable, the center of pressure is going to be behind the center of gravity, okay? Every time? Every time for a stable arrow. If this center of pressure is in front of the center of gravity, your arrow is going to lift from the front and it's going gonna, it's gonna to wind plane and it's going to fly off. It's never going to come back. I don't want to get into bullets versus arrows, but let me just say the reason that you spin a bullet very, very fast is because the center of pressure is located ahead of the center of gravity and it's a dynamically unstable system unless you spin it like, like a, a football top, like a football we did exactly that. Like we a used football. that example last year mm -hmm. if this condition is true and that is that this torque is greater than this torque the center of pressure will end up behind the center of gravity and it will always try to restabilize if you if you if this is pitched up center pressure is here it pushes it back if it goes too far the center, of the forces tend to switch in the opposite direction, and it pushes it back, and so it tends to wobble until it and until it comes out. And I, I like to think about this in terms of driving a car, because you're always going to have lift uh, when an arrow flies, even if you have a perfectly straight shot, and you're like, wow, that's that's dead, not straight. It's always going to wobble a little bit. Always. 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 Even if it's flown exactly straight it will begin to wobble a little We're bit. We're just trying to get it, it as tight as we can. That's right. That's right. Trying to get it as tight as you can. Here's a perfect way to understand this. If I'm an outside of a car and a car comes driving by a straight road, right? That car looks like it's going, from my observation of this car going by, it looks like it's going straight. But if I'm sitting in the car and I watch the guy who's holding on to that steering wheel, what's he doing? He's making very minute corrections in order for that car to be going straight. And that is exactly what your fletching does for your arrow to, to control it, to make it go in that straight line. And that's why, because the line of action of this is perpendicular to the arrow shaft, as opposed to horizontal with the arrow shaft, why lift is such a huge factor in stability and drag is not. So to think that drag adds to, in a major way, the stability of the arrow is not the right way to think. So when you put on bigger fletching in order to put more drag in the back, I would counter with this thought experiment. Take a take a your regular arrow and screw a bottle cap on the nose between the insert and the field point. Okay. 
and shoot it. You've generated a ton more drag in the front of that arrow than you did at the back by putting that bottle cap on there. Yet that arrow will still fly straight. That's because drag is not what stabilizes the arrow. It's the lift that you get, at like your hand going out of the window. Again, this can be very easily... I don't want to put the formula up here, but it's in the books uh, of being able to calculate what the center of pressure is. As long as the center of pressure, and that's the center of lift, uh, determine, or the, yeah, the center of where the lift is. Let me just write that on there. That's L, L tail plus L nose. That's the total lift of this and this. It's concentrated at one point. And if that center of pressure is behind the center of gravity, your arrow will have stability. How do we get there? Both how do you get there and how do you control it? What yes. factors now will let you move this as far apart as possible because the further these two parts are, the more stable your arrow is. Okay, the quicker it will recover, the less wind deflection it will have, the straighter the arrow will be, even with a larger input uh, offset or something where where maybe you're not shots not right you've torqued the bow a little bit it comes off at an angle the right? farther apart those get basically the more accurate yeah you're going to be yeah in a, right now here's what i discovered watching these experts on on youtube and all everyone seems to understand that if they move the center of gravity forward that they get more stability out of your arrow just like you and i were talking about today but what they don't know is that there's another knob to turn, which is moving the center of pressure back. So if you have an arrow that, uh, let's say, is a really long arrow, like your case, and you, put, you go from 150 to, to 200, you may have moved that CG just a couple of percent. But where, you're, where you could also gain is have large fletching in the back. If your CG doesn't move forward, but you want to get more lift out of the back of the arrow, you put, a, you put fletching on that has more surface area on it, you're going to get more lift and you're going to move that center of pressure back. So it's, it's two buttons to turn, not just one, of, of controlling the stability of your arrow. So in order to get that as far apart as possible, let's say you had three fletchings back here, but your arrow is not flying as well as you, you would hope, but you like the idea of putting a big broadhead up front, okay? You've moved the center of gravity forward a little bit, but you want to move the center of pressure back. You could go from a three-fletch arrow to a four-fletch arrow, get more surface area back there, I, a.k.a. more lift, and you will get a more responsive arrow that wants to damp out. And like that, that steering wheel example will be less that he has to correct in order for the arrow to fly straight. So I hope that makes sense. It's a very simplistic explanation, but, it, but it's ex exactly what happens. Uh, drag doesn't cause stability, it's lift that causes stability. So some really light arrows and like target shooters might shoot blazer veins, tiny veins mm -hmm. in the but back. they're tall. Tiny, fl okay, they are tall, that's true. And a lighter tall. point in the front. What is that achieving? So one of the things that we need to understand. Or are you just constantly looking at balance and that's it? Well, there's there's some games that you play. You know, when I, I watch the videos of the Olympic archers and they're shooting arrows that fish tail and bend and they do all of this, yet they go down and hit a bullseye at, at 70 meters, mm -hmm. right, in the wind. You're like, well, what's going on here? The difference is the difference between hunters who are shooting broadheads, which are basically big wings, right, and uh, target shooters that are shooting, you know, a very low, almost no lift. This number is field zero. Point. Yeah. yeah. It's a field point, yeah. right? There's almost no lift. And when there's no lift right here, the only thing you have is the torque of the lift of the tail times its distance to the CG, and it will stabilize. And that's how you could get away with shooting a very light spine, a low, uh, high number spine arrow and get it around the riser uh, in a target situation because you're not generating lift off the front of that arrow, right? But I guarantee you, you take that field point on and put the same weight broadhead on the front of that and try to shoot that arrow. Big difference. You probably won't hit the target. Right. Not at 70 meters, not sure. at 20 meters, because you've gener now you've generated that lift that you can't get rid of. But when you introduce more fletching and more helical, you're going to slow the arrow down. We haven't seen that. Right, or no. We haven't Actually, seen that. Actually, I think we tested that, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we tested that last year. And because that was what a lot of people thought was like the more helical that you're going to have in your fletchings, the more 
well, at least this was the initial hypothesis. This isn't the case. I'm just saying the more drag, quote unquote, you're going to create and it's going to slow your arrow down. But when we tested that, we didn't see that yeah. to be the Especially case. Especially in the higher mass ones. Yeah. Yeah. Even the low mass arrows weren't terrible. It wasn't a 20%. I mean, it was it was single digit percentage difference, right? Yeah. It was the higher tiny mass, difference. Higher mass arrows just shook it off. Mm -hmm. We did it twice because we did it at Jeff's yeah. too. Yeah, we did it at Jeff's too. But so bear shafts were That awesome. kind of opens another can of <laughs> – that opens another aspect yeah, of this. Yeah, it does uh, about about roll and stability. Yes. Okay. Don't use the word spin. Just roll. Not anymore. <laughs> this arrow is rolling. The reason that you roll an arrow is to average out any uh, asymmetries in the launch or the flight – or the mass asymmetries, or the arrows bend a little bit, or the fletching is not quite right. And so you'll roll that asymmetry out, and you'll still roll around the line of the, of the trajectory that the arrow is falling, following, and you'll hit the target. That's the only reason that you roll an arrow. Now, having said that, you do incur some drag early on in the flight as the arrow is rolling up to its uh, final speed, right, because it rolls up. But what happens is as it rolls up, the drag uh, that you saw earlier on gets lower because the air is, is equal on both sides of the fletching. So in other words, the pressure on this side of the fin as this arrow is rolling now is the same on this side as it is on this side. It's but at the initial a, launch, it was pushing harder on the, the inside. At the initial launch, it's mm -hmm. pushing harder on one yeah, side yeah. than That's the other. That's why it That's takes why it a certain up. period for an arrow to stabilize and flight. Right Not to stabilize, but to roll up to its okay. final roll rate. It starts at zero, right? Because okay. it's ti attached to the string. Yep. You let it go, it starts at zero roll rate, and it slowly rolls up to a steady state. We saw that on your video rate. you were showing me last night, Greg. The arrow it looks like it's real slow, like it's fighting, and all of a sudden it just takes off, and then all of a sudden it's rolling yeah. at the highest rate. It, it rolls until the pressure is equal on both sides. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you only get the increase in drag, really, for, for the kind of angles of deflection that we're talking about, you know, one degree to let's say nine degrees is max at the very initial phase of the launch but once it rolls up and it continues to fly you don't really see a high increase in drag because the arrow you know in one case the arrow is really rolling fast and in the other case it's rolling really slow but the pressure on both sides of the of the um of the fletching is the same right and then and therefore it's not it's not creating a lot of drag so just to, for the audience this will make your mind this will be – hold on. <laughs> so, Big Jake, when you launch your arrow, does this. It's rolled, it's bent, and it's at lift war. Pitching and yawing. Pitching and yawing. Yes. That's correct. Pitching See, and I yawing. pick up things. Just little – Look at little you. Yeah. You're a damn genius. Yeah. <laughs> but at launch, the first thing to move is the knock. It bends. And then the point takes off. There's no f possible way it happens all at the same time because they're apart, separated. Yeah. Bends, starts rolling, and it's bent, and it's doing some of this. And we want it to stabilize as fast as possible. So we want the center of, center of gravity. Wow, the center of gravity, that's a heavy fletching. Yeah, don't use that as, a, <laughs> as an example of where the center of gravity should be. So no point. Yeah, but it's 100 and 10 grain insert, isn't it? Yeah, it's got a 100 grain insert in it, so it's a little bit out of the dead center, right? That's the center of gravity. And the center of pressure is back here somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's hard to calculate. And, and I love you, man, but the center of gravity moves around. Uh, pressure moves around, too, but we're not going to go into that. No, we are going to go into oh, it. Oh, come on, Barnett. We've got to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've got to. People need to know. Center of pressure moves around. Oh. Yes, this is a problem. Okay, so most people are like, hey, the center of gravity, it's a fixed location. And it is, and it depends on your point weight. But if you have windy conditions and you have a low forward to center, let's say you're shooting like a 5% forward to center because you like the way the arrow moves. It's a very light arrow. It shoots really fast. And you're like, ooh, I'm happy. Well, that's fine. And maybe you test it indoor or something. You got your arrows flying great. And you go out and in windy conditions, windy conditions will create an angle of attack. That is the angle that the arrow meets the air. And when it creates that angle of attack, it creates lift. And guess what? The center of pressure is going to move forward. 
your stability is not just dependent. so it's going your stability is going to decrease because your, your center is of pressure is getting closer to your center, center of, gravity. of gravity and when it when it gets to the center of gravity or not very far away you it got becomes bad le- you've got a bad situation because the wind might cause that center of gravity to move up to or very close to the center uh, uh, the center of pressure closer to the center of gravity, and your arrow becomes unstable. During the flight. During the flight. From zero to 30 yards. Could be. Yeah. How do we fix that? Move the center of pressure back far enough. With what? Bigger fletching. Bigger broad head. fletching. Not or bro- bigger point weight. Well, heavy, higher point weight. Okay. Mo- now you're moving the center of gravity forward. You can do both. You can move the center of pressure back. You can move the center of gravity forward. What you don't want are these two to cross. Ever. Right? Ever. And and to know that this moves with the wind tends to move forward. That's because the angle of attack tends to increase if you have a side wind. And that will move your center of pressure forward. So what so. is the helical doing then? Is that just is that rolling your arrow faster? Like the sharper your helical is on your fletchings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so rolling the arrow faster and stabilizing up, up, it quicker? Up to the Stable roll state. up to the roll rate. Right. So okay. So it's getting your roll rate. It's getting it up to the the desired roll yeah. rate faster. So when I talk to my friend right? Bob Potter at Boning, okay. who knows more about fletching than than anybody else I know, I, right? Yeah. You have to assume. He says there's no such thing as a straight fletch. That all fletching is helical. All fletching has to wrap around the shaft. Okay. And so uh, you might look at it and st- say it's straight, but it's actually on a line. It's rolling around the shaft. And the more that you, you turn it, the more it's rolling around the shaft. If you, So take that up with Bob. Hey, Bob. I, uh, I buy that from what yeah. I've seen. Like It yeah. looks like even the ones that are mostly straight, they have a very slight degree of helical. Yeah. And yeah. then there's the, the ones that are around. just turning well, way now, around. If you're a barbershop pole. Yeah. Yeah, like a barbershop pole. Mm-hmm. Right. It, it, you know. It's it's got to wrap around to to get around that cylinder, but here's the thing: if you if you did make straight fletching, right, it will it will be more draggy than a helical fletching because as the think about um, the air ro- make the arrow still and the air is rolling around it, it's going to roll around it in a helical pattern. It's going and so you want that pressure on both sides of the arrow fletching to be the same. Right, the pressure on this side is the same as that, and that's when you hit the steady state roll rate. So, um, so we talked about we talked about drag and how it doesn't contribute to stability. We talked about lift and how it contributes to stability a great deal. We talked about things that you can do to fix your broadhead or your aero system to make it more stable, right, and uh, add insurance to your flight. And I'll go through that again. Uh, a heavier point will move your center of gravity forward. A vented point here will get rid of the lift that you're generating up in the front. And we'll, that'll tend to, for a given arrow, if you take go from a solid to a, to a, a, a vented, will move the center of pressure back. But only because you've lowered this number. Right, and that'll the move wind the center can go through the holes. It can go through the holes. Yeah. There's no lift. There's yep. not. I mean, it, basically, if you had just a wire, there'd be no lift at all. Right around there. That's why right. you don't want big, wide, solid broadheads. Really, I mean, un- unless of- unless you can add enough center of gravity yeah, right. to compensate for that. Right. right, right. And now you're talking really heavy aero systems, and some people like that. Uh, that's and that's what you're doing. You're moving that center of gravity forward. Okay. The other things you can do are. Uh, Shoot taller fletching, right? Move the fletching as far back as you can. Whatever you can do to move that center of pressure back. And so one thing, if you're looking for this in the in the literature, this idea of what's called a statically stable projectile, is this distance here is called static margin. So what you're trying to do is is get the static margin as high as possible. The margin means that's more safe, the word margin. Static means you don't need roll to be able to get this stability. Okay. Remember, roll does not add to stability. Roll makes your arrow more accurate because it's roll averaging any kinds of inputs that you might have given it that are bad inputs that as it flies down range, it roll averages out those. Roll helps m- average your mistakes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 
that you're making when or, you release or, air. Or the geometry mistakes. Okay. Maybe a, a fletching is maybe you pulled it out of the target and it's and one it's and it's kind of wrinkled, yeah. Yeah, right? right? It's kind of wrinkled. Any I did imperfections that last night. or whatever. In Any the imperfections. The entire system. Right? Or maybe there's a seam inside the the carbon fiber. Is there a point of diminishing returns? Like I haven't I haven't found it for the arrows. You haven't found it. No, I was going to say, like your center of pressure never gets all the way back here. No, it, it really doesn't. Uh, the center of pres pressure typically for an arrow that's a target arrow that has fairly good sized fins is sitting uh, a few centimeters in front of the fletching. So it's, it's way back here. What really drives the center of pressure forward is putting these broadheads on the front. And this is the reason mechanical broadheads fly so well. Right. right, They fly like field points because you've eliminated this uh, lifting force at the nose. There's a couple of things that I want to talk about here that uh, I have not found in the archery community. We talk about them in the, in the military community quite a bit, and the model rocket book talks about it, and that is uh, resonance. And you're like, what the heck is resonance? Resonance is like when, is when you get a license, and that's where your license is cheaper than when it's a non-residence. <laughs> <laughs> Residence, yeah. Residence. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, okay, uh, no. Resonance is what happens no. when your washing machine suddenly starts walking across the floor. When the load is off balance and it's spinning at a certain frequency and you can hear it, and it, and it begins to resonate, right? The, the rolling of the, of, the, of the washer and the frequency that it's able to bounce around they match, and now the thing's in resonance. There are places in flight where you could possibly run into resonance with your arrow. This is one of the very few things other than an act of God, which means like a twig or wind shear or some, some weird thing that happens in flight that doesn't happen at the bow but can happen further downrange. So the first step is let's, let's look at the history of an arrow when you shoot it. It tends to look like this, right? This is zero, so zero, and then your target's out here somewhere. So this is just generic. It starts at zero and it begins to roll up, but then it reaches a steady, what's called a steady state roll rate, and that's what it's going to do all the way down to the target is roll at the, whatever the cant angle of the fin sets such that it rolls up. And this might be 20 revolutions per second or something. I don't, I don't know what the number is off the top of my head. Right now, it depends on what your cant angle is. Okay, here's, here's the issue with that. And, and all arrows do this unless you have straight fletching. Even straight fletching, if it's feathers, will tend to add roll to your, to your arrow, right? Because they're naturally curved. Feathers are bent, yeah. Feathers are bent. And so this is very common. And it's the same for military projectiles, tank gun projectiles, arrows, uh, whatnot, that start at a zero roll rate and then roll up to a specific I was watching a YouTube video where the guys were talking about, oh, man, if I could spin these arrows, and this is their words, if I could spin these faster, I would have more stability and this arrow would fly even better. But that's not true. And there's a particular reason why that's not true. When your arrow bends or when it's launched, you set up a condition where the arrow is going to continue to flex and fly. You saw that too, Greg. And this does not get damped out. In fact, it's carried to the target. And Troy is the first person I've heard talk about this that when it hits the target, that little bit of bending in flight can be amplified again so that it's a major problem when it hits the animal. If your arrow is bending, it can, it can re-energize the arrow because you've added, you know, that impact has added more energy and the arrow and the thing can flex. Well, that flex is at a certain frequency and that frequency is uh, somewhere around 80 cycles per second, 80 to 100 cycles per second. I'm going to write that right here. Let's just say that the bending frequency is 80. Who was the guy who said that that bending, that bending never stops inside of 120 yards? H.O. Meyer, The Physics of Archery, is a yeah. paper you can find online. That's H. It never period, stabilizes o, inside period. of 120 yards, he yeah. said. So it's yeah. all the way. It's always going to be doing this. It doesn't damp out. It never stops wiggling. So here's the point. If your roll rate ever goes... Above the bending frequency, you're going to lock in, and the arrow is going to fly off the shot line. It's called uh, roll lock-in. And what's happening is your arrow is bending at a certain frequency, and it's rolling at a certain frequency. So let's say your arrow is bent up like this, and then you roll it, and it bends the opposite direction. Guess what? It's bent up again, and it tends to want to veer off in that direction. 
So that's the that's the first boundary. And it turns out that you can't roll through that roll rate. If you try to put on fletching, let's let's say 12 degrees or 15 degrees, what happens is it bumps up against that that bending frequency of 80 hertz, 80 cycles per second, and you can't get through it. You can't roll your way through that. That's a, just a physical phenomenon. Once it gets in resonance, it's very difficult to stop that dishwasher or that washing machine from moving around. And, and, and that's what we saw with the high helicals that we tested. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what we saw with the because we did uh, three, six, nine, twelve, and fifteen degree yeah. helical on slow mo, and the the really high helicals literally six, three, and six degree did good, and then the really high helicals. So there is a point of diminishing crazy. returns with it. I thought it would can't. just continue to dampen, dampen, and stabilize. Yeah, it was amazing. It was that makes loops. sense though, because then you can't go above that. Right. And I don't know if you've stated, stated why yet. Um, it just locks in. It, it tends to, um, even though aerodynamically you've got the tor the torque trying to move it through there, the bending happens. It it exacerbates so quickly what's happening with the arrow that it never has a chance to continue to roll. It will just. It's called catastrophic yaw. You you get into a point where the arrow just goes wonky, and so you you can't really try to roll very fast through this. When that happens, you're usually at the part where this is beginning to bend over and it's reached its final roll rate. Um, and so um, before I get to what you should do, let's talk about another frequency where this thing can meet resonance. And that is the, the porpoising or uh, uh, what's the sideway? Okay, pigeon Fish tail. yaw. Yeah, right. pigeon yaw. <laughs> yeah. Fish tailing or porpoising, a.k.a. Uh, pigeon yaw. So if this is pitching, it's typically pitching at a certain frequency as well. And so if you're trying to roll at that frequency, let's say you're pitched up and you're rolling at the frequency that you're also pitching at. This is rolling up. Now it's rolled down, right? We've all shot the broadheads that go, Woo! Oh, yeah. and that makes your arrow do this. Yeah. And so if you have very low helical, like one degree, maybe up to two degrees, you like that, and you're like, oh, that's because I think it's not going to produce very much drag. Possibly downrange, you're going to run into a problem where uh, if you're basically trying to roll and make it look like this. Okay? So in one case, you're rolling super fast, and in another case, you're trying to roll underneath that pitching frequency. And, and what I'm going to tell you is the best, what, what people have found who've done this a lot, is to roll up so i'm just going to draw this dotted that you're rolling through here but it doesn't really get through there and it, it locks in there is to roll through the pitching frequency and stay under the bending frequency how do we know all this stuff how do we know it from how archery? do we do it how do you do Some it guy in is, his backyard figures that out yeah what you need to do is limit the uh, you need to roll through the pitching frequency as fast as you can, early as you can, and then stay under the bending frequency. So I'm gonna tell you what we found from our testing is that the maximum helical that you would want to put, the maximum angle is about uh, below nine degrees, probably closer to six. So there's like a happy a medium for There's a happy helical. medium, right. Does that change with the weight in the front at all or doesn't have anything to do with it? What it will do is no, well, Okay, so if you put a lot of weight on there, what you're doing is you're bringing, bringing the bending frequency down. Okay. It, it, will, it will drop, okay? And so now, now you're, if you roll with that same uh, roll rate, chances are you're going to hit that bending frequency. And okay. so if you do that, you probably want to bring your helical down to about four or your, your offset. Because I shoot a degrees. lot of point weight and very low helical length. They yep. shoot really, yep. really well. Yeah. But I didn't. I, this is a new thing to me even. Uh, yep. This is something the last six months we've looked at, and he's been trying to get into my head. That's interesting. Because that I didn't. I would have never expected that, that you can go too high with your helical. Yeah, we thought so, too. We thought too it was going to shoot much. like a bullet, and it was a disaster. Yep. And honestly, in the, to the naked eye, it didn't look terrible. We knew, but we had paper. So yeah, we had paper. We had paper, so yards. we knew it was terrible until you slowed it down. Um, I remember looking at that video, going, "You got to be kidding!" <laughs> and I mean, it was literally. It looked like that. It wasn't just a. It wasn't like and the one the lower helicals, if they shot kind of, nine, kind of leaned. Yep, nine. Nine didn't really close. swirl. It just kind of went. I want to do that, and it was real slow. But the fifteen was just 
it was amazing. If you put like a 16 blade broadhead on there and just really rake them, <laughs> yeah. or a pitchfork. <laughs> so fortunately, the through empirical evidence or whatnot, people understand about three degrees or so is is a good place. However, you put a broadhead on there, you take that field point off and put a broadhead on there. Guess what? Your that three degree is going to put you back down closer to the pitching and yawing frequency, and you could have problems. And so the best way I can tell you to to try to solve that problem is put some paper out at about 20 yards, put your broadheads on here and shoot your arrows. And if your field points give you bullet holes at 20 yards and your uh, uh, broadheads do not, I would play around with the with the roll angle of your fletching. If you're shooting you a super shot, change your fletching. Yeah. Yeah. If you're shooting yeah. a super or add one. Right. Okay. Add well, the angle is still going to be the same, so the oh, maximum yeah, roll yeah, rate yeah, yeah, is still okay. going to come up to that whatever that can't angle. Super big. So big either it, you might have to increase or decrease yeah. your a- your angle, your flexion. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Your helical. Super My guess is you'd you'd probably want to go up to about uh, somewhere in the four to six range to be relatively safe because it's much easier to get through this than to mess with this. This is very catastrophic. Super bendy arrows that. are going to affect this too. If you shoot a really light spine arrow to, just because of you're shooting fast, yeah, that's yes. a, you're, you're adding a bending frequency that's outrageous. Yeah, you shoot a low spine arrow, this bending frequency is going to be on the order of 80 or so. And if you put a, a 9 degree fletching on there, you're going to run into this problem. So people won't shoot a 9 degree fletching, but, they'll, but, but they, they might. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. It's real common for people to shoot a very light arrow very light spine arrow to go fast, just based on grains per inch, and put five inch fletchings on it, or or something big, or that's. I think it's one of the why, reasons why four fletch is popular. You've you've proven why it is, but I think it's popular because they think they can get the full, the, the the super banana arrow yeah. to launch it seventy pounds going three twenty. Right. And they're shooting. It's really bending at a super high frequency, right? Or is it slower? It's not a higher frequency. It's a slower. It's a lower frequency. But big bends. Yeah, really I've heard a few yeah, guys bends. talk about. Uh, you know, if you go to an archery shop occasionally, they'll they'll say, "Okay, you're going to shoot a fixed broadhead. You need to go to four fletch." Yeah. Because it'll help. Their reasoning was always that it would it will help spin the arrow faster and decrease the amount of lift that you've got right off of the bow. Mm-hmm. But it's rolling or, yeah remember that it's rolling from zero rolling so the first 15 feet or so where the arrows accumulate arrows accumulate the most it's hardly rolling at all yeah but now I, we know that it's not just doing that right it's also changing the center of pressure well that's correct there's a lot that's when going you on when there. you add yeah. that fourth fletching yeah the more which he is talks going to yeah. help your arrow flight that's the more right. i learn from him the more i say how in the hell do we ever hit anything yeah, yeah I mean, that's honestly, all I'm thinking about right now is I'm like, <laughs> I got a million problems. Listen, <laughs> hey, listen I'm, I'm, I'm videoing doing you tonight. You got to shoot straight. So get it out of your head. No. <laughs> so when I'm saying I have all these problems, I'm just like, I'm probably overthinking it to a certain degree. You're just talking about how to get the most efficient arrow yeah. ever. Yeah, what path You're, to go hey, through. Right, right. right. You're well, looking at all those Or if you have where, problems, just a thought process on sure. how you might want to fix yeah. that, how you might want to approach Solutions. I like the, the analogy of the knobs that you can turn, yeah, like what he I was saying too. a while ago, because I've always just thought, like initially, we were just adding or subtracting point weight mm-hmm. to a bear shaft. Mm-hmm. And, but cha- then, and things like changing um, your rest and stuff like yeah. that, too. Oh, yeah. Like, that's mm-hmm. another knob I, I've... Right, to, you know. to make the arrow come off the bow straight. Yeah. Um, or straight as possible. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it's never going to be completely yeah, straight. That's right. But um, you, but the forgiveness, what you, what you were talking about earlier today, you get more forgiveness. You get more insurance, and you, you have ways to mask a, a bow that's not well tuned mm-hmm. by doing these kinds of things. Sure. Or so. like in, in my situation, like I know I have a bad grip. I don't know if I could relearn how to shoot a bow. Like, when y'all got your fingers up like that, I cannot get hold the bow that way. Mm-hmm. It, it just doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. Whether or not it's something learned or, I can, you know, maybe I can do it, but I don't think I hold the bow right. I think that's an issue for me. That's when when you're... When you're getting this insurance, you're fixing mm-hmm. a bad grip mm-hmm. too, right? You yeah. can dial the arrow. Yeah. 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 That's why I have the right. tuning kits and stuff. That's something I discovered. I don't, I've never been taught how to shoot for them. I shot whatever. Yeah. So it's probably well, that's, sloppy. That's my biggest thing when it comes to, like, practical application with that, with hunting mm-hmm. is, you know, in the yard, and we've talked about this a dozen times, you're squeezing your back, 
you know, muscles together, you're squeezing the trigger off, mm-hmm. you're, you're trying to get the perfect anchor and the perfect grip. I mean, that's just what the target shooters say to do. Mm-hmm. When your heart is beating a thousand miles, or in you're, a minute, you're, and you have a giant buck right. walking in underneath yeah, of you. you know, a lot of that stuff goes lean a tree completely the out the window. Or, or in a st- you so know. if you have something that is yeah. that you can't, that right. is more forgiving, yeah. you have higher odds of hitting your Yeah, just think point. about That's how right. variable your position in, whether you're on the ground and tree stand in a oh, saddle. Oh, you're ducking I underneath mean, limbs, you're, trying you to be curve like, that thing around a bush or something. You're telling me you got like, good grip when you're shooting yeah. out of a saddle like that <laughs> right. it's yeah. like nah i'm not worried about my grip i'm worried about putting the pin i'm, I'm really worried about anchoring the bow still so it's yeah, like right. that added forgiveness yeah. is what's helping Absolutely. you in yeah. that in that situation yeah. and that idea of static margin more margin means more forgiveness yeah yeah that that's a, that's the biggest takeaway more margin more turn the knobs get some margin boom okay okay Perfect. full circle boom that's it, and that's where we end. Because I feel like now I got some cloak. Because for a while there, I'm thinking, dude, oh man, I got all these things. <laughs> <laughs> that's overwhelming to me. We're gonna have to jab him with some zannies. <laughs> <laughs>